Okay, so welcome back everyone. If you're rested, relax. Ready for the second half of the semester. A few announcements. Um, everything on the regular schedule right away. Um, presentations on the cards. Um, so please attend the presentation. I'll be asking Reese and um, Ben to be working through some sort of circuit, current, resistance, um, voltage type problems in presentation, obviously to help you get through the two upcoming P sets. Don't forget there are two due this Friday, I think the number six and seven. Um, we have the second midterm scheduled for next Thursday in class. Uh, there'll be three problems on it. I'll see how things look at the end of this week. Um, for sure, chapter 21 through 25 inclusive. We'll certainly get into chapter 6 material already, um, maybe in the class today, but certainly on Thursday, so I'll see how that looks. There's a sample midterm posted, um, so please take a look at that. Um, I tried to find one that was where I thought it's closely synced with where we are right now, but maybe a little bit um, a little bit off there. We'll see how things look. Um, some of you have asked about the midterm one regrades. Take me a while, I'm going to get them back to you on Thursday class. And then lastly, total different topic. Um, I, when I'm not doing my day job, um, run a program here at Columbia called the Science Honors Program. Possible somebody here is in it. Yes. Okay. Um, so it's a good, really long standing, it's now in the 61st year, I think science and math outreach program to local high school students. Um, those students come to campus on Saturday mornings and take classes from faculty, postdocs, grad students across the campus. Um, it's a program that students, um, it's competitive admission, so as part of the admissions process, we ask them to come and take an exam. And there are two dates for these exams are being given, both in April, the first is on April 6th, there will be another one on April 27th. Um, there will be 2,400 high school students on campus, um, and in order to manage that number of high school students, we need expert adult help, which is where you come in. So, if any of you are interested in proctoring and chaperoning thousands of high school students, on um, in particular April 6th, um, there's a couple of sign-up sheets at the front. You will get paid for your services. We need you from about 9 until 1.30. Um, okay, just a little bit after 1.30, and you will get paid 100 bucks for the privilege. So, um, I know April 6th, some of you are aware something else is going on on campus that day. Um, but this is in the morning, so you can have fun chaperoning high school kids, and then you can go and have fun doing something else. Okay, so if you're interested, Sign up at the front um, after class. Sign up sheets and just pick up one of these and I will be in touch. All right. So, we're going to um, continue talking about charge, um, current charges in motion, current. And in fact, this is a good kind of picking up point after spring break because pretty much the entire rest of the semester we're going to be discussing what happens when charges move. Okay. We've already introduced this at the end of Thursday's class before the break, where we introduced current, the as you can see on the board behind me. Um, but it turns out, aside from the many, many interesting and extraordinarily useful uh, applications of charges in motion, it turns out that charges in motion are also the source of magnetic fields and magnetic phenomena. So of course that's where we're heading in a few sessions from now. Um, we'll probably get into it before the second midterm and it'll occupy us for much of the rest of the semester. So charges in motion is really um, the theme for the remaining seven or so weeks. Uh, so things we're going to cover up on the right hand uh, chalkboard is a fairly kind of introductory various notations, definitions, um, simple things primarily about important components of circuits. So you'll see some of the lists up here. We will take a little bit of uh, a look aside from the macroscopic phenomena, we'll also look a little bit at microscopic phenomena or microscopic 
uh, understanding of what's going on with charges in motion. So we'll talk a little bit about um, the sort of uh, typical speeds that charges might move in materials. Um, and then we'll look in a little bit more detail and see if we can understand some of the behaviors by a very simple so-called free electron model of materials that have charges moving through them. So that'll take up most of the day. Um, hopefully we'll also get to come back and talk about um, electromotive force, which is really the uh, source, if you will, of devices that provide potential differences, batteries most commonly. Um, and then we'll start towards the end of the day and we'll certainly carry this over into Thursday's class. Um, we'll start looking at circuit analysis. So today will be fairly low level. Um, some of the microscopic stuff is a little bit more detailed. And then on Thursday we'll do a fair amount of problem solving in the class. We won't do any of that today. We just need to sort of set the foundations for doing those types of analyses. Okay. So, let me pick up where we left off before the break. We have just defined current, which is basically, as you can recall, the rate at which charge moves, moves at a certain point, so it's u by dt. And as you know, we're defining charge motion or current in the direction of positive charge carrier. You also know that's historically a little bit weird, um, or at least it's not really connected with the um, most common type of charge carriers in most materials negative charge carriers where it's a convention that we are sticking with. So current is in the direction of positive charge carriers. Okay, you know a lot now about charge conservation. Since currents are simply charges in motion, it won't surprise you that we ought to expect current conservation. And this will fairly quickly feed into uh, circuit analyses on Thursday. So for example, let's say I have some setup that charges the roof currents, <coughs> and it's not just some single conducting pathway. It's something that has maybe forks in it, there are branches coming in, branches going out, and of course this is what most circuits look like. So I could imagine, just as a sort of example out of nowhere, I have a piece of a conducting system that maybe looks like this, and maybe I would have current coming in on the left side, we we'll call this I, and then maybe there's a junction here whereby a current can split into a number of possible paths at this point. And all we expect to happen now if we have current conservation is that the sum of currents at any junction is constant. Okay? So I'm going to write this as the sum of the currents in equals the sum of the currents out at any junction in some conducting network. Okay? In this case, that would just simply tell us that I1 plus I2 plus I3 better equal I. We do not have systems that have leakage. We don't have currents coming in or going out in any way that is not being taken care of in this respect. So this is simply charge conservation. Okay? So very straightforward. We're going to use this more on Thursday. What I want to move on to next is talk about the concept of current density. Um, very often we might either assume or be told that um, the current through some material is essentially uniform throughout that material, but it doesn't have to be. So current flow in material may not be uniform. If that's so, we want to have a little bit more understanding at a smaller level of possible variations in current within different parts of the material. So this is going to lead us to current density. And the picture I'd like to have in mind, both maybe as a sort of um, visual picture, but also in terms of mathematical um, formulation of this, comes back to what we talked about with electric flux. And you'll remember when we talked about electric flux, we essentially find a flux as being, let me just put this as an aside, we might describe this as an integral of E dot dA, something like this. And so this would simply be counting up how much electric field, electric field lines is passing through a certain surface, maybe closed or open, keep it open for now. 
So we're looking at the amount of electric field lines passing across the surface, and not in any random way, but with this very specific setup. So that we're counting the electric field lines, or at least the component thereof that crosses the area perpendicularly. Okay? So this was the idea of electric flux. What I'm going to do a little bit by analogy is introduce the concept of current density. And I'm going to write it like this, and then sort of work it backwards a little bit to really define current density. So obviously it looks very similar in, in mathematical definition. Now we're talking about a local current density. And so the same way you might have a mental picture of electric field lines kind of moving in some random pattern, maybe something like this. We've got some area that we're going to define dA like this. And we've got our flux defined as, as the total sum of electric field lines passing perpendicularly through this area. We're going to do this exact same thing, but instead of electric field lines, we're going to replace it by whatever is the local current density <coughs> in the material. Yeah. It doesn't need to be uniform, it could they vary in magnitude, it could vary in direction. Not so common in many cases that we're actually going to look at, but you can imagine that it doesn't need to be uniform. So if we adopt this um, idea now of current density, we're essentially defining it in this way. And if we have a uniform um, current density, then of course, this thing is just a constant. So we would have in this case that I is just J times A, and to make this even more simple, let's say that, um, that the uh, J is, uh, let's say, I, don't know, uh, I want to say that it's parallel to DA everywhere. Okay, so we can easily imagine this is true, it's constant magnitude, it's just passing, let's say, uniformly from left to right through this area. Um, it's passing through it perpendicularly. So in this case, this becomes a very simple summation. It's just the current density times the total area. And this eventually allows us to kind of get a obvious unit definition for current density, which is to say it is current over area. So amperes over meters squared. So all it is is recognizing that we may not have uniform current. If we don't, we maybe want to understand what the local current looks like, how much of it, what they're coming <coughs> in. That's the information that's captured in the current density. And again, I like this visual mathematical um, similarity with our definition of electric flux and the electric field passing through uh, a certain area. So that's pretty much um, all I want to say about it just now. Um, this is going to be again defined in terms of positive charge motion. So this should be for positive carriers. And pretty much for now, that's all we need to know about it. We'll come back in a little while and relate it to some of the microscopic behaviors, but pretty much that's what we need to do. Any questions on our introduction of this idea of current density? Okay, so. Let me take the first of two um, digressions into looking at things at a little bit of a more microscopic level. And this is going to be to learn something about drift speed of charge carriers. So um, we want to see what we can learn by looking at this in a very simple microscopic picture. But let me just set the scene for this um, just so you sort of know what we might expect. What are we talking about? We're talking about when we apply, let's say, a potential difference across some material that has mobile charge carriers, the conductor. We expect those charge carriers to move, and we're interested in asking and then answering the question, how quickly do they move? Um, we talked a little bit before the break about a sort of common picture of conducting materials, particularly things like metals, where it turns out the way that metal behaves is we have let's say fixed positive ions of whatever it is that makes up the metal. And then around them we have this sea of negative charge carriers, um, some of which are free to move. 
And of course, these are some of the electrons that have been liberated from their parent atoms in the metal. So we kind of imagine this as being a sea of free electrons that's sort of um, enveloping this um, sort of matrix of fixed positive ions. So with that in mind, um, we can imagine that those electrons are moving in some random way, and perhaps that random motion is a little bit thermally driven, and in fact it is very much thermally driven. So I have two quick questions for you, just to get a sense of what your maybe pre-existing knowledge is, or what your um, educated guess might be. The first question is, any idea what would be a typical speed of that random motion of those electrons in a chunk of metal at room temperature? And the second question is, um, if I take that chunk of metal, apply an external electric field, it's going to make those free charge carriers start moving, whatever direction they want to move, depending on the electric field. What would you guess as being the typical speed of motion, average motion of those uh, drift carriers? So two questions. Average random speed of the charge carriers <coughs> without an electric field, and then I apply an external electric field, typical value, thousand volts a meter or something. What sort of drift speed do you expect for those charge carriers? Any ideas? Or if not, any educated guesses? I'm not very sure about the first part, um, but I would think it'd be very, very fast. But the second part, I think it would be on the order of 10 to 0, so a couple of meters per second. Uh, good. Any other inputs? Thoughts? It's actually very slow. Um, uh, it's not like the crystal. It's like the air plane. like the crystalline structure of metals. Um, and you give an electron. Being pulled in some direction, there's a very high chance of hitting a nucleus of uh, one of the atoms. If you think about any given cross sectional area, yep. there's hundreds, I mean, there's millions, billions of atoms. Yep. And if you multiply that by the length, so I think that the, like, the length of the wire, the longer the length of the wire, obviously, the longer it's going to taper the drift. Yep. Um, okay, good. Uh, quickly, yes. Three times ten to the minus four meters per second. <laughs> Is that close? Uh, that's pretty close. Okay. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, okay. So, just a quick summary. Um, yes, it turns out the random motion is very fast. Um, probably of order ten to the five, ten to the six meters per second. But as Joseph told us, um, it's in a very congested environment. Of course, metals are solids. The uh, nuclei of those um, metal atoms are very close to each other, so there's a very short mean free path before these electrons bump into one of these more or less stationary um, ions. And so in fact, um, while they're moving overall very quickly, um, it takes a long time for them to move a short distance. It's like kind of being, I don't know, maybe in rush hour on the subway, I don't know, Times Square or something, a lot of people moving very quickly, but your rate of progress in a certain direction is pretty low because you're constantly bumping into people, you're getting reflected off them, and so you're kind of um, finding it hard work. So the actual sort of drift speeds typically are about 10 to the minus 4 meters per second. So there's this huge 10 orders of magnitude difference between average speeds of free electrons in these metals and the actual drift speeds. So we're going to just um, describe that a little bit and see what we can learn about the relationship between the drift speed and some of the other parameters that describe such a situation. So let me just write those two pieces of information up there. So the average uh, speed of our, and again we're talking about electrons here, is typically around 10 to the 6 meters per second, but the average drift speed, as we're going to call it, again for the electrons, and now this is with an external field, about 10 to the minus 4 meters per second. Okay. So I'm going to look at a simple section of conductor. We're going to apply an electric field across it. 
see what we can say about um, the charge within it, how long it takes to move a certain distance, and then combine those pieces of information together to come up with something about the bridge speed. So let me take a simple, maybe cylindrical cross-section of conducting material. I'm going to give this a cross-sectional area big A. Talking always about positive carriers by convention, though pretty much this doesn't care whether we're talking about positive or negative carriers. We're going to be applying an electric field that drives a current from left to right. And so we know the electric field is indeed in this direction. We're going to assume a uniform current, so our current density J, whatever it is, um, is certainly also left to right and it is uniform in this case. And we've got these things moving from left to right with our drift speed, V sub V. Okay? So all of these parameters are shown going from left to right. And then the last thing I'll define on this is that the length of this piece of conductor that we're considering, we're just going to call big L. Okay, so with that set up, in a length L of this <coughs> material, so first off, we need to introduce some measure of the density of charge carriers. And we're going to define this as little n. So this is the density of charge carriers. Let me see what we might guess for things like this. Um, not the easiest thing, but um, Chunk of metal. Um, any ballpark guesses of with some metal that maybe has on average one free electron per parent metal atom? What might be a kind of typical charge carrier density in a chunk of metal? And I'm looking at, let's say, a number per cubic meter, something like that. Let's see how. how Good your general knowledge is here, sort of basic reasoning. I, 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 I remember the name of this Okay, hold yes. off. Okay. For someone who doesn't remember the answer, what's likely to be the key number or key consideration when we try and figure out what, what this is? A mole? A mole? A mole. And what, what is a number that we always associate with a mole? Avocado's number. Avocado's number. <laughs> Okay, um, we got through, yes, um, which is about? Uh, 6 times 10 to the 23. Okay, good. So, Avogadro's number, number of fundamental constituents in what we define as a mole of material. Um, okay, uh, let's see again, how good your sort of back of the envelope estimates are here. Um, knowing what the mole of copper corresponds to maybe roughly or at least a half guess. Um, and then give a guess for how many moles of copper might be in a cubic kilogram. Take those pieces of information and give me a guess of what a charge carrier density in a chunk of copper might be. Hmm. Remember I'm looking for something in number per cubic meter, meter, for example. Times only looking for a kind of ballpark order of magnitude answers. No? Yes? I don't know the density of copper. Wait, what do you mean? What, do you mean? what are you trying to find? No. Okay, I guess ballpark okay. answer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, 10 to the 25. 10 to the 25. Um, so, suggestion yeah. being yeah. that there might be a order of 100 moles in a meter of the copper, maybe. Um, or not even that, actually, 10 to the 25. We started off with 6 times 10 to the 23, so it's more like um, maybe oh, wait, something no. like that. Sorry, um, any, any, one other, okay. any other um, estimates? Yes. What's the magnitude of the density of copper? Like, in what order is the density of copper? Because then I could, like, give up. So, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you. You should have a... Oh, I just idea. have memorized the density well, of copper? Well, you should have a rough idea of <laughs> density of solids, yes. What? Okay. Um, yeah. How much does water... What's the density of water? 
It's like a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. How much denser than water do you suspect a topo might be? I don't know, like three? Four? Like an order of magnitude. Six. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up pretty quickly. I'm spending a lot of time on general knowledge. But, um, you know, some of the denser solids that we might be familiar with, lead or something, they're typically 10, 20 times denser than water, okay? So copper is probably a few or a few times more dense than water. I don't know what it is exactly. It's like an order of 10. A order of 10, that's okay. right. Okay, so if you put all of these numbers together, you're probably expecting charge carrying density of maybe 10 to the 27 or 10 to the 28 charge carriers per cubic meter, okay? So this is the density of charge carriers. Uh, okay, so with that said, um, in this length L, the number of charge carriers, total number of charge carriers, is simply N times the volume, so we're going to call this A times L, without parameters. The total amount of charge in this volume is the number of these things times the charge on our carriers. Let's just assume that these are single electrons. We're going to have the fundamental charge on the electron here. So that would be an estimate of the um, total number of charges in that volume of length of L. What else do we know? What about the drift speed? So <coughs> drift speed. about this, this is simply a measure of um, how things, how quickly things are moving. So if we're looking at a certain point here, yeah, maybe we would take the end here, and we're looking at the drift speed, we can basically define this in terms of the total length over the total time. So this is the time taken for drift carriers to move from one end to the other. So this now tells me that the time here is just L divided by the drift speed. And then coming over to the left hand side, this stay here, relatively close. So now I can define the current. over T, and with the quantities that we determined over on the right hand side, we've got this, my speed is L, so my time is L over the drift speed, and this now tells me that the current is N times A times E times the drift speed. Okay? So let me just take this information and do one last manipulation with it. The current density, then I'm going to say we're assuming this is uniform, so it's just I over A. And this becomes N times E times the drift speed. Okay. So simple way of relating something about drift speed with either our current density or our current. end up with those relationships. So not really much to say about this, it's a very simple analysis, but now we've got a little bit of a relationship between what's happening on the macroscopic scale and what's happening on the microscopic scale. Alright, so now we've explored a little bit current and current density, we're going to turn our attention to devices that we're trying to drive this current through, and in particular devices that have some resistance to that current flow. And obviously that's introducing us to the idea of resistive devices. So we're going to explore this for the next 10 or 15 minutes with just some basic definitions. <coughs> and we're going to come back and talk a little bit more with a microscopic perspective. Okay, so resistance is a 
measure of materials resistance to current flow, obviously. this um, pretty much in the following way. So I'm going to use this for a definition, triple equality. I'm going to define it as the relationship or the relating quantity between an observed current